Good afternoon. First, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today on our continuing series of webinars for what I like to call As ACE Implements. We're excited to be able to partner with APHIS and their team, ACE team, to present all of these webinars that are going to help everybody as we move into the mandatory filing for APHIS in August. A couple of reminders before we turn the presentation over to Ricky. All participants are in listen-only mode. If you'd like to ask a question, please make sure you put the question in the question box. The webinar is being recorded and the presentation and the recorded webinar will be available to all registered participants. And a copy will be posted to the NCBFAA website as well as the USDA website. If time allows at the end, we'll start answering the questions that were presented, but each question that's received will be answered in a timely manner. One of the things we'd like to ask everyone to do is if you're participating in the conference call now, if you would send an email to ei at ncbfaa.org for your CCS credits. If you're attending with the group in your office, we only need one email with a list of attendees um, for the webinar. Now what I'd like to do is turn the webinar over to Ricky Leshin, who is the APHIS coordinator for ACE ITDS. And Ricky, if you're ready to go. Yes, uh, APHIS would like to thank NCBFAA for having us. I'd also like to remind everyone on, on the, uh, all the attendees that this presentation is being recorded and will be posted after the presentation. Uh, also on the line are our team members Marco Flores and Jeffrey Beeman from APHIS. So this presentation describes how to submit APHIS required data for regulated fruits and vegetables within the Department of Homeland Security's Automated Commercial Environment, or ACE. This presentation assumes the viewer has reviewed the first presentation using the Automated Commercial Environment ACE to submit import data for APHIS regulated commodities. APHIS regulated fruits and vegetables include frozen or fresh fruits and vegetables that are imported for consumption and not processed beyond being fresh or frozen. Some fruit and vegetable imports such as purees, pickles, cooked material, and dried material are considered miscellaneous and processed products, part of the APO700 group, since they are processed beyond what is considered to be fresh or frozen. Please note that this presentation will not address specific import admissibility questions, but rather provide general information about import conditions and ACE data entry. Fruit and vegetable imports are regulated by APHIS Plant Protection and Quarantine, which is agency program code APQ in the APHIS core message set. This slide and the following two slides are diagrams from the APHIS core message set implementation guide. These diagrams, along with others from the guide, may be useful for filers to understand the flow of the import data required for fruits and vegetables. AP0600 definitions, of the codes may be found in the appendix PGA and the technical rules enforcing use of certain codes may be found in the implementation guide. This diagram shows the overall PG10 commodity category and type, PG14 LPCO, and PG01 agency processing code for all APQ regulated commodities. Filers can use this diagram to find the specific business diagrams in the APHIS Core PGA Message Set Implementation Guide for AP0600 commodities, which are highlighted with the red boxes on the slide. This diagram is one of the two highlighted on the previous slide. This diagram shows the relevant PG06 processing type codes, PG10 category codes, PG10 Commodity Qualifier and Characteristic Codes for the AP0600 commodities. For example, lettuce from Mexico would not require a PG06 processing code if, not, if no treatment is required. Lettuce would use a, zero, a 601 above ground parts category code, all parts of a plant growing above ground. Fruits and vegetables would have three choices for commodity characteristic qualifier codes. FRC, fresh chilled, FRS, preserved by commercially acceptable freezing methods, 
in such a way that the commodity remains at minus 6.7 degrees Celsius for a minimum of 48 hours prior to release, or SHR, shredded or chopped with leaves not exceeding 10 centimeters in length and 38 millimeters in width. This slide shows some of the data elements that must be provided in the APHIS Core PGA message set for fruits and vegetables. Please refer to the APHIS Core implementation guide for a list of mandatory data elements that must be entered. When shipment information is entered into the message set, it must include coding, which directs the information to the agency and program unit commissioned with regulatory authority over that commodity. For imports of commodities regulated by APHIS, the government agency code for APHIS is APH. For commodities regulated by APHIS Plant Protection and Quarantine, the government agency program code is APQ. Most fruits and vegetables are inspected by CBP Agriculture, which is declared using the government agency processing code A01. The category type code AP0600 identifies the shipment as being fruits and vegetables, and the corresponding category code determine if the shipment is considered an above-ground part, below-ground part, or whole plant. This information assists inspectors during the document review. The PG-10 record line is the primary architecture used to help stakeholders correctly report commodities within the APHIS message set. This record line is critical for APHIS message sets because it supports the ability to filter and efficiently align commodities into specific groups. The main data element, commodity category type, is the top-level grouping which allows commodities or products to be lumped and or split into specific subgroups using the data elements associated with commodity categories and commodity characteristics. Plant protection and quarantine will continue to require an issue permit. You must continue to submit government certifications as original paper documents, for example, phytosanitary certificates. As mentioned in the previous presentation, APHIS PPQ issued fruit and vegetable permits paper, are, have a paperless link to ACE, provided the correct permit information is entered into the PGA message set. Information contained within the permit may also be of assistance when entering message set data. For example, the type and number of commodity, import address, destination address, and country of origin are all listed within this document. The import permit type shown on the slide is the one typically needed for fruits and vegetables, the PPQ 587-56, which is PG 14 type code A19. Please note, additional permit types may be required if the regulated commodity under fruits and vegetables is considered to be regulated as a live plant pest, biological control agent, or noxious weeds, PPQ 526, or is considered a protected plant, PPQ 621. While the phytosanitary certificate itself must continue to be submitted in original paper form, the certificate number must be provided in the message set. This is important in order to ensure the correct certificate is attached to the corresponding message set and PPQ permit if required in the ACE system. Please note, a phytosanitary certificate is not always required. APHIS regulations will determine if one is required. Having a copy of the phytosanitary certificate will aid in the submission of the APHIS core message set. Information required in the message set that may be found on certificates include exporter name and address, importer name and address, commodity description, genus, species, treatment type or country of export, and other items. For pre-cleared fruit and vegetable shipments, filers will need to report the APHIS PG01 government agency processing code as A03, I'm sorry, A03, APHIS pre-clearance. The foreign site certificate of inspection and or treatment PPQ203 in the PG-13 and 14 lines as an LPCO, and PG-30 inspection testing status 
as P to document the occurrence of a preclearance inspection with arrival location code 3. This document can also assist with PGO6 processing type code for any treatments that were performed. Now we will walk through a single example of filing ACES core message set for fruits or vegetables. Most fruit and vegetable filings will be similar in nature with different commodity information being provided. This walkthrough will go from PGO line to the last PGO line. This may not be how your software vendor has set up filing the APHIS core message set. The filer would report agency code APH for USDA APHIS, program code APQ for plant protection and quarantine, processing code of AO1 for CBP agriculture review, and an intended use code of 230.00 to identify the goods for consumer use as human food in the example of fresh that frozen dashing. In this scenario, the importer identified they will be submitting electric, electronic images for PGA review. All entity and proprietary business is treated as confidential and as such, that field should always be coded as Y for yes. The genus and species must be entered as a data element. Primarily, this data element can be found on the phytosanitary certificate or provided to you by the importer. In the PG06 line, the filer would identify a source type code. In this case, 262, which is the place of growth PG. These codes can be found in the appendix PGA. The country of origin may be found on the phytosanitary certificate preclearance form or permit. This product does not require treatment as a condition of entry and therefore no processing codes were entered. For the PG-10 commodity characteristic information, a category type code of AP0600 will be used to identify the commodity as a fruit and vegetable. The category code further breaks this down with code 603, below ground parts, for the example of frozen dashing. For fruits and vegetables, the only qualifier code option is A61 physical state, which is followed by the characteristic qualifier, in this case of FRF for fresh frozen. Above, you can see that the phytosanitary certificate shows that the commodity was stored at minus 12 degrees Celsius, which meets the criteria described earlier for fresh frozen. In addition, the permit po points to the commodity as a frozen commodity. For this filing, the import requires both a permit type A19 and a phytosanitary certificate type A01 to be reported in the PG13 and PG14 lines for LPCOs. For the permit, the date qualifier is 1 showing the expiration date of the permit. The transaction type would be 3 because it has a start and end date. The phytosanitary certificate would have a date qualifier as 3, which is the date the certificate was signed, and a transaction type 1 because it is a single-use document. The slide shows an example of a phytosanitary certificate number, and the filer would enter both the numbers and the letters. For the PG-17 wildlife commodity information, APHIS requires only a specific com common name, aka a vernacular or colloquial name, in this case, Dashin. APHIS requires the reporting of contact and address information for two entities beyond what is found in the CBP header data previously reported. For the PG 19 and 20 lines, the ultimate consignee code UC and the customs broker code CB or an importer code IM when a broker isn't used. The ultimate consignee, as defined by APHIS, is the party in the United States to whom the overseas shippers sold the imported merchandise. If at the time of entry or release, the imported merchandise has not been sold, then the delivered to party or ultimate consignee at the time of entry or release is defined as the party in the US 
to whom the overseas shipper consigned the imported merchandise. If the imported merchandise has not been sold or consigned, consigned to a U.S. party at the time of entry or release, then the delivered to party or ultimate consignee at the time of entry or release is defined as the proprietor of the U.S. premises to which the merchandise is to be delivered. In other words, the party who has been designated on the invoice packing list as the final recipient of the stated merchandise. APHIS also requires the reporting of contact and address information for the LPCO authorized party, or LAP, where applicable. If an LPCO in PG 1314 is reported, then LPCO authorized party and corresponding contact information PG 1920 is required for the UC, for the ultimate consignee, customs broker, or, or importer if no customs broker is used and the LAP when applicable. The LAP localized authorized party varies depending on LPCO type. In general, this is the issued to party or holder of the LPCO. For APHIS permits, the LAP is equivalent to the permit he, while certificates generally use the term issued to party. In some instances, certificates have two parties listed. Therefore, the entity who conveyed, in other words, requested or paid for the certificate should be used. This is normally the foreign party entity present at the time the document was created and signed by the foreign government official. Continuing on, the PG-26 is used to identify the packaging and quantity. In this example for frozen dashin, the filer is using one to identify a single packaging and then is reporting the amount in kilograms. If cargo is shipped via container, that information would be reported in the PG-27 line. For PG-30, the inspection status is I, product location for regulatory authority inspection. When reporting I for the inspection status, the filer must report the arrival location code as two. The arrival location would be the first port of arrival and would be transmitted in the message set as the port code. For PG32 routing information, the shipment did not transit or transship other countries, so a code of 198 would be reported for the original location. In this example, Fiji, FJ, would be reported as that country. One of the resources available to brokers, filers, and importers is the APHIS Fruits and Vegetables Import Requirements Database, commonly referred to as FAVR, which allows customers to search for authorized fruits and vegetables by commodity or country and quickly and easily determine the general requirements for the importation into the United States. In addition, the user can select to search by scientific name along the right-hand side of the web page. The FAVR database will provide a drop-down of scientific names and take you to a commodity summary page of approved countries. These drop-downs can also provide guidance on the filing of the PG-17 common specific name. Additional resources available. APHIS core message set questions can be sent to ace.itbs at usda.gov. Please be sure to provide us with screenshots if possible, error codes, and other relevant information. APHIS and CBP have multiple resources available to filers to assist with APHIS Core PGA data submission. You can find all these resources on our APHIS ACE website. The APHIS ACE website any exemptions on filing message set and entry types where APHIS Core flagging will be enforced. In addition, the APHIS ACE website links to many CVP ACE appendices, DIS implementation guide, Appendix R, CVP ACE DIS PGA forms eligibility list, and others. APHIS import eligibility questions, does APHIS require an LPC for importing a certain commodity, should be referred to the specific APHIS program that regulates the commodity. Resources for contacting APHIS regarding such admissibility questions 
can be found on the APHIS import-export page, page, web page, or by contacting the APHIS Customer Service Center. At this time, I'll turn it back over to Myra Reynolds for a few more comments, and then we'll open the line to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ricky. Um, before we move into the questions, there's an old Chinese proverb that says, tell me and I forget, show me and I remember, involve me and I understand. John S. James was one of the pilot participants in 2016 for the APHIS filing. And it, at the beginning, it was daunting with an implementation guide that was over 400 pages. But we started breaking it down and focusing on each of the individual agency program codes. And I'd like to applaud uh, APHIS for not only the way they created a document that gives me an if then. So if you have this product and you have this agency code, then here's all the information that you need to have. And also their appendix, which further defines the information and makes it a lot easier for us. We had a client that brought in vegetables and the vessel arrived every Sunday. So 100% of the containers went into the reefer stack. So the USDA through um, APQ could take a look at the documentation we submitted on Monday and the containers started rolling out Tuesday afternoon or Wednesday. After our pilot program, we went from 100% of the containers being held to one or two containers being held and the remaining containers were loaded onto gensets and ready to roll out of the port Monday morning instead of waiting. So between the time that they were able to get the product to market and not having to pay for repositioning on the port, each vessel saved our customer thousands of dollars in additional handling charges. So it was a win-win for us in participating. One of the things that I tell everybody, and we've done this internally at John S. James, is instead of printing the 400-page document, just bookmark that portion that applies to you. The uh, implementation guide, there's some very important parts that I have dog-eared. Um, if, if you look into the implementation guide, fruits and vegetables starts on page 207. There's a full grid of a, a data example by PGA record. So they give an example of the Clementine and they go through starting with the OI all the way to the end of your PGA message set to give you an example. On page 210, they have a full form mapped. So they've taken the permit and mapped it to the PGA record set. So you get to see what's the PG-14, what's the PG-19 or the PG-20. Page 275 is where it starts the if-then explanation. And on page 333, they give you a list of the rejects and the possible solutions. And in the appendix, the first 28 pages are very important and they talk about the disclaim methodology, how you disclaim, the reporting for disclaim, how you do your agency processing code based on your APHIS form, what information is required also to have a DIS submission. And it's very important that you look at the rest of it, page 28 through the end, because that's your list of harmonized numbers, which give you a description of the harmonized number, your APHIS flag, your primary category type, the category um, APHIS program code. So it's important that you take a look at this. There was a CSMS message that was issued in December. The CSMS, CSMS message number is 408. 49049 that gives you a link to the appendix and the implementation guide. You can also find it, as Ricky mentioned, by going to the ACE CATER and clicking on the PGA message set. So with that, we'd like to move to the um, questions. The most asked question right now is the email address to get your CCS points. That address is ei at ncbfaa.org. EI at ncbfaa.org. And again, you can send one email for a group and just list those that are participating in the call so they could all receive their points. So moving into the questions, one of the first questions asked was during the last webinar, it was advised that there was a standalone filing procedure for the APHIS Lacey. And the questionnaire questioner was asking, is there a link that you could provide, Ricky, for that? A link to the APHIS Lacey information? The, they said there was a standalone AC Lacey Act filing procedure and wanted to know if you could provide access to that feature. 
what we can do is we can uh, we can work with Lacey to upload a link to our ACES ACE website so that any information related to ACE, Lacey can be found there. And we'll, we'll be sure to have that up soon. Okay, thank you. The next question says, the category codes have been reduced to just three rather than the long list that was previously used. That is correct. I believe we listed them in the presentation. There's above ground parts, below ground parts, I believe, and uh, shredded. Okay. Next question. Is the AO3 to be used for pre-cleared products? Will these be released quicker if the documents are in APHIS core? They'll be able to be reviewed quicker. Um, so CBP Agriculture will still have their process for holding and releasing cargo. Um, and we can certainly forward that kind of question to them. So, uh, yeah. Okay, we'll provide further information on that one. Are there tables available available for the category types? For instance, is there a table which shows that tomatoes from Canada would fall under category 613 for fruit and Mexican lettuce would fall under 601 for above ground? This is Marco, I can jump in on that one. Uh, 613 has been discontinued. Again, we, we went to, uh, I believe, those three uh, options only, uh, you know, above ground, below ground, and all, all the whole plant itself. Um, so this, you, you only need to use one of those. You don't need a 613 anymore. Uh, I forgot the exact numbers. I, I think it's 6, 1, 2, and 3. I, I forgot exactly what they are, but there's only three options now. So you just need to use one. Does that answer your question? Um, I, we'll find out. The next question, is SPP acceptable for reporting species when the genus is also provided? As long as the requirement uh, isn't for both genus and species, if, there, if the requirement is only to provide genus, then SPP would, would suffice. Okay, is there any specific criteria that must be followed for the common name? For instance, can filers pull the line description into the common field name? In addition, how specific must the common name be? Can filers transmit tomato for both grape tomatoes and plum tomatoes as an example? So I would say, um... I'll have to get back on the specific on the tomatoes. However, uh, the FAVR database, which I showed on the slides, would be a great place to find common names that are accepted by, uh, by ASIS. Okay. Next question is, I do not see that the globally unique product code was included for the dashing example. Can this be admitted from entries? If not, how would importers and filers determine when the globally unique product code is required? I, I can jump in and I can answer that one. Um, that's an optional field. You can add the uh, unique identifier for using that, um, uh, that, that reference, you know, the, whether it's taxonomic serial number or global product code, uh, that's an optional field. Uh, so if you want to add that, That'd be great. If if not, uh, it's optional. I can say with John S. James, we've added it. It seems to make things go a little more expeditiously. Um, next right. question: Are electronic image submissions required, and if so, under what circumstances? I think they're talking about the DIS images. Yeah, and uh, a great resource for that is the um, appendix, the trade supplemental guide. Uh, there's a whole table that outlines when it's needed, when it should be ma just mapped into the message set, when it's required in paper, and when it's required in DIS submission. Um, trying to see here. It looks like it's on page 20, starts on page 24. Okay. I was looking for that. I had that in my notes as well. 
is there a how-to webinar or uh, training for the um, favor? Uh, I would have to get back, but it's a pretty um, simple uh, web interface to use. There's just a, it's all links, and it'll pull up information as you go through it. So you would search by commodity name or country, and then it would pull up list. If you search by country, it pull up list of commodities that are enterable from the, that country. And then and as you click on a further link, it would show you the entry requirements. Okay. Will the pre-cleared A03 code um, provide, would you need a copy of the PPQ203? Would it be accepted by US Customs AQI or will APHIS Core allow for the paperless release of pre-cleared or pre-treated commodities? So the, the form itself is not required in the DI, in a, as a DIS submission. However, CBP Agriculture may request the document as a verification on the shipment that's coming in to verify that it was pre-cleared. Do the treatments have to be filled out? If they are cold treated in transit, would we put the date that the cold treatment should complete it? I believe that's reported in the PG-06 line. Uh, you'll re report the processing type and the processing start and end date. Okay. Is there any support and onboarding process for filers who want to start submitting the APHIS core message set for fruits and vegetables? The, the, you are available to start submitting the message set now. Uh, I don't believe, other than proper software, there's anything else that's needed. During this transition time, if I understand, it's um, everybody should be able to participate and file if their software is ready. And would APHIS be reaching out to the individuals if there are issues or if they have a problem in their filing, would that cause a delay in the release of the cargo? So if, if they're filing now, um, They'll get the may proceed if the message set goes through. If there are issues, they can email us, but at the, during this transition period, they can always back out of filing the message set and have the cargo released to the traditional method. Thank you. Um, the common name from the implementation guide APHIS utilizes to report let's see, utilizes this data element to report generalized common names aka the vernacular or the colloquial name of commodities. Example, citrus is a generic name for specific common names of lemons, clementines, and limes. Peppers are a general name for general peppers, I mean green peppers, red peppers, and jalapeno peppers. Um, I guess what they're asking is, is there a common name or do they have to be specific in that it's instead of peppers, it's a green pepper or red pepper or jalapeno pepper? when you're using the common name, when it says in the implementation guide? I would say to be as specific as possible. Yeah. Someone wanted a clarification on the category question. It says the question was if there was a table correlating when above ground part 601 should be used versus the 602 code. If they go to the appendix PGA, there's definitions of each of those codes. Uh, on the version I have, it's uh, page 58. They'll have definitions of above ground parts, all parts, and below ground parts. Okay. Is there a field for a general common name and a specific name? There used to be. Is that still true? Uh, the PG-17 line requires the, the common specific name. Uh, the data element common general name is no longer a required field. Okay. That seems to be the end of our questions, so I guess everyone's ready to roll. Um, I still got a couple more questions about the email address for your CCS points. That is ei at ncbfaa.org. And just to remind everyone, too, the webinar is being recorded. 
And so the questions and answers will be part of the um, presentation that we send out to everyone. So you'll get a copy of the presentation, the audio portion, and we will be working with APHIS to get answers to all of the questions and out to everyone. And if there's, if there's no other questions, what I'd, I'd like now is just to thank everyone for participating in the call and the questions that were sent in. Um, hang on one second, we've got two more questions. Um, they were asking for the link to the APHIS core guide. So what we'll do is we'll send that out when we send the presentation, we'll include the link to the implementation guide and the appendix for everyone. And I'd like to remind everyone that our next webinar is gonna be held next week on February the 20th at one o'clock. And that particular webinar is gonna be covering animal products. So if there are no further questions, I'd like to thank everyone for your participation in the call. Ricky, we really appreciate APHIS um, reaching out to us and allowing us to assist in putting on these webinars for our members. Thank you for having us. And we'll see you next week. Thank you very much.